All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I am Jasmine Navarez, Digital Content Coordinator here at Simulations Plus. I'll be hosting today's webinar behind the scenes, making sure we don't have any technical difficulties. In this webinar, Dr. Tatiana Verbeek will discuss cl clofazine PKA determination. Well, there, thank you. The underestimated yet significant influence of molecular aggregation and Dr. Rebecca Ruiz will talk about flab flavonoids and some examples of challenge PKA determination. Additionally, Eric Jumois, Senior Director for Business Development, will discuss the power of data sharing and will also serve as our moderator today. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We take your privacy rights seriously. By registering for or attending this event or participating in the Q&A, you're allowing us to contact you for follow-up. You may ask questions via the questions panel on your dashboard at any time. If you need assistance, please use the hand raise icon. We'll address all questions in the Q&A after the presentation. So I will now hand it over to Eric. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Jasmine, and uh, thank you uh, for to both of our presenters today, uh, whom I will introduce. So Dr. Tatiana Verbeek is an associate professor at the Department of Analytical Chemistry at the University of uh, Belgrade, where she obtained her uh, BS degree, Master of Science and PhD. Um, her research is focused on fundamental uh, scientific studies of various types um, of uh, chemical equilibria in uh, biologically active uh, or relevant molecules. She is involved in uh, physical chemical compound profiling for drug discovery and development with a special emphasis on ionization processes and experimental PKA determination. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Ruiz is a principal scientist at uh, Pyron Inc where she's responsible for designing and conducting a research experiment. Uh, she obtained her PhD in, a, in analytical chemistry from the University of Barcelona uh, in Spain. And her thesis was focused on studying and evaluating a range of techniques and instrumentation for PKA uh, determination. She also investigated other properties like log P, log D, and solubility. Uh, Rebecca's experience spans both industry and academia, uh, as she's worked for Almiral in Spain and as a senior scientist and at the University and the University of Barcelona as an assistant professor. So join me in welcoming uh, both of them to uh, our event today. And uh, Tatiana, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I just pressed the button on my, my stopwatch so I can control the speaking time because as you have heard, I'm probably the only one that is uh, working as a, pr a professor right now. So it's my duty to, to teach about science, not just to do the science. And as you can see, uh, the, the famous Brooklyn Bridge is in the behind because I will present you the, the part of my research that was actually done while I was doing, uh, while I, I was doing the research uh, during the uh, Fulbright grant uh, in New York. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Robert for inviting me to share these results. And I also like to thank you, Eric, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk today. You have seen the title and, um, you know, like uh, determining the, the PK is something that we usually do at the beginning, no matter what kind of physical chemical uh, characterization we are going to do it with the substance. substance. And you know, like I'm still working in the in the university. So at the university, we are not in the demand of real demand of high throughput research and high throughput screening. So we can still, because we are lacking the money, we can still uh, uh, devote a lot of time to one molecule. And it's usually some specific molecule that we are uh, that we have chosen. So clofazamine was chosen like three years ago, actually, when I was writing the project. Uh, when I wanted to, to join uh, two of my professors who I collaborate for, for several years, uh, Professor Abu Zerajuddin and, and uh, Dr. Alex Avdiv, who is hopefully uh, listening to this lecture right now. And when it comes to Alex, he's always picking up the, the worst molecules to, to work with. So clofazamine is known for more than five, uh, five decades. 
It's a very hardly soluble molecule. You can see the structure on the on the side here. And as soon as you see the structure, you would see it, it's quite hydrophobic. And uh, very, very, it has very, very low solubility. So it was discovered in 57 when it, it was discovered, it was already published in the nature. Uh, it is an orphan drug, meaning that it's used to treat the very rare disease, diseases like uh, leprosis. And recently it is used to treat the tuberculosis. It's known because even the single dose, which is usually 50 milligrams per day or 100 milligrams per day, is causing the crystallization of the clofazamine in the tissues and in the liver, especially in like in the grease tissues in the in the body. Uh, it came to the stage again during the COVID time because you know, like uh, in the era of repurposing drugs in 2021 during the COVID time, clofazamine was taken again to the stage as the possible inhibitor of some some of the functions of the uh, coronaviruses. So th this is not the reason why we have picked it up. The reason why we have, pi we, we have picked it up for the, for the research is because we wanted to try to make it more soluble because this is something that Professor Zarajudin's lab is famous for. But, and on the regular route of our analysis, we usually determine the PKAs at the beginning. And at the early beginning, what was strange with the clofazamine as a tough molecule is that when we have searched the literature, you know, we found a lot of different values. As you can see here through the literature data, the range of the PKs have spanned over three orders of magnitude. So it you know, like drew our attention and we said like, okay, this is what we have found in the literature, we, we can find in the literature. So the first topic was like, let's try to determine the PKs because this is something we regularly do in the decades. When I say we, I mostly think about Alex and me. Uh, we also found several values, uh, predicted values, and uh, as I'm in contact with Robert for more than 10 years, luckily I always, when I have a new compound, I mean like for me, a new compound, I ask Robert to predict the volume, and you can see that the admit predictor could gave us actually the volume of uh, 9.1 for one specific PKA. Uh, we'll see when we see the structure, of course, this is not the only volume that we got with the admit predictor, this is the structure and you can see that there are three possible nitrogens that can get protonated. So when we saw the structure, we were not sure whether uh, within the physiological pH range, we will have one or two dissociation processes. As, and if you remember, actually, if we can again see this, this table, uh, most of the papers that we have found in the literature, we're talking about just one PKA. But some of them were also mentioning two. And sometimes they said like one PKA is six, the other one is nine, or they were speaking about just one single PKA. So we started, you know, like the experiments. And when I have the new molecule, I usually like to play with the UV visible spectroscopy because somehow like when you get the spectra, you can see a lot of things. And I also, you know, like clofazamine is very nice. Um, it's colored, it's actually the azo dye, as you can see from the structure. So it was very nice to play, uh, to play with it. And here on the up, uh, on the top of this slide, you can see actually a lot of different solutions. I mean, like clofazamine solutions, 20 micromolar solution uh, within the different pH values. These solutions were made in the phosphate buffer. So you can see from the color change, actually, that in water, pKa is somewhere Somewhere it looked to us that the PKA is somewhere between uh, five and six, just according to the to the uh, color change. And then I started the experiments. You know, like I wanted to obtain the spectra. I saw the compound structure, and when you see this uh, big uh, pi electron system, you can guess if you are used to work with uh, UAV spectroscopy that if you prepare 10 to minus five molar solutions, you should get a nice spectra. And I made a plan and luckily I made a mistake. So instead of diluting uh, my stock solution for hundred times to get 20 micromolar solution, I diluted it a thousand times and get two micromolar. I got two micromolar solution. And while I was obtaining the spectra, recording the spectra, actually, I immediately saw that something was wrong because with a 20 micromolar solution, I for sure wouldn't expect the absorbance to be uh, such a low. But I said, like, why not? You know, like this experiment is taking me, will take me an hour or two. Just let's, let's continue and finish the experiment. 
I knew that with such a low absorbance, you cannot really quantitatively and precisely calculate the PK. But I said like, okay, if it's too micromolar, probably the probability for precipitation would be lower. And that was actually the true. You could see that I got a lot of spectra. This was done as the pH equation. I could go to a pH that is over 10 without really visible precipitation. But you know, like in uh, one of our previous sessions, we heard that if there is the precipitation in the solution, of course, the first thing that you see, even if it's not visible in your solution that you take in your hands, uh, if you are analyzing the spectra, you can see that usually uh, on the wavelengths that are higher than 500 or 600 nanometers, as here, you can see the rays of the baseline. And this is actually that was uh, that I saw in the spectra even before I saw the precipitate in the in the solution. But for me, you know, like I have more than 20 years uh, of experience in analyzing the spectra without the software. Uh, for me, this equilibrium looked like there are two possible PKAs. Because you see, like uh, when I was changing the PKA, P, uh, pH going from 3 to 10, if you have the isosbastic points, you speak about the one single equilibria. But if you have two different groups of spectra, like we have like these first coming from the acidic region uh, and rising up the, uh, the pH to the alkaline region, and then you have this group, of course, the absorbance is lower because, I mean, like, of course, there are some electronic uh, PI electrons changes in the structure. But the first look to this spectra gave me an idea of having two PKs within the physiological range. So I thought, you know, like Robert gave me this, admit predictor, admit predictor gave me this PK volume. So I said, like, OK, probably we can catch both of these Two PKs. But then, of course, I did the experiment as it should be done. And when I raised the concentration to 20 micromolar with such a low soluble compound, of course, the precipitation started as soon as the dissociation of the nitrogen atom, protonated nitrogen, nitrogen started. But again, you know, like I saw that there is a dissociation going on even before the precipitation started. When the precipitation starts with a regular analysis, I cannot run the experiments anymore because, you know, like I'm used to calculate everything without the software, just according to uh, what Albert and Sergine proposed in the 70s of, of the last 70 years of the last century. So it's, you can analyze the data with a simple linear equations, but just if you have just one single equilibrium established in the solution. So I said like, okay, let's try to analyze uh, the spectra with the addition of the methanol organic solvent who that would of course change the solubility. And then I did the experiment with, with, with the 20% 20, uh, 20 volume percent of the methanol. And of course uh, the spectral change is still visible. Precipitation started a little bit later but the first difference that I saw when I calculated the PKA according to Albert and Sergine is quite high difference. You know, like delta PKA was 0 0.7 comparing to what I got with a simple analysis in the pure water. Then I continued experiments, you know, like I did similar things. I mean, like the same titration uh, with a 40% volume percent of methanol and with a 60% of methanol. I look at this, of course, like the precipitation point would uh, was uh, was in a, a higher pH, but the spectral change has shifted. And when we came to 60% volume, there was no precipitation, at least not uh, visible precipitation. But again, as very similar to the experiment that I that I did with two micromolar solution, you can see that there are all of these spectra can be uh, I, I actually assumed that there are two groups of spectra. And it again gave me an idea of having actually two PKs within the studied region going from pH 3 to pH 11. But again, you know, like I, I still noticed the, the rays of the PKA in the 40% methanol volume percentage. We got 8.5 in the 60% solution, 60% methanol solution, we get. 9.5. And of course, you know that um, if you are changing the, the media, like if you raise 
the organic percentage of the organic solvent, of course, that you have that you have to expect the pKa change. But what was strange is, you know, like the clofazamine is a base. And when the base is dissociating, what you expect with the, with the raise of the percentage of the organic solvent is the pKa to decrease. Increase of the pKa with the percentage of the organic solvent, actually the decrease of the dielectric point is something that you expect, expect what you are speaking about the acids. So from the early beginning, these, let's say simple experiments, we noticed that something is strange with the clofazamine. We had the pKa change, but it was not going in the right direction. With the raise of methanol, we expected that the pK would decrease. And also we were not sure, you know, like Alex and I were arguing about whether we have two pKs in the physiological region or we are speaking about one. So we said, okay, you know, like the, the golden standards in the pK determinations are spectrophotometry and the potentiometry. And we who are skilled in this, uh, in the pKa determination, experimental de determination, it's good actually if we can do both techniques because then you can you can overlap the data and see whether you are getting the similar or same result. So we decided like, let's do the potentiometric titration. With the potentiometric titrations, you always have the problem because the potentiomet potentiometry is less sensitive. So you need to have the higher concentration of the compound that you are titrating, which with the clofazamine was the problem. So we did a lot of titrations in order to get the, the, the voluble data. Uh, we had to raise the percentage of the methanol. This is uh, now calculated the weight percentage of the methanol, but still you could see these nice colors uh, clofazamine in its acidic protonated form is red. This is actually the moment when we started the, the other, the second titration, but you can also see like the, the um, alkaline solution is yellow uh, because the molecular clofazamine is yellow and you can also see the orange crystals of precipitated clofazamine. This is of course the titrate. I mean, like on the right side, you can see the titrator that we used for the titration. Uh, with the potentiometric titration, the theory says that you uh, calculate according to uh, to Bierum, uh, father and son, Danish chemists, you calculate the formation function, you plot the values of the formation function uh, dependent on the pH value, and then you can actually see where the pKa is, and you can also see how many dissociation processes were going on. And for sure, when you analyze this Bierum plot, you can see that there is no way that there are two dissociation processes going in the solution if we were going from the pH a little bit lower than four to pH a little bit higher than 10. Four. So when we did potentiometric titration, we were sure that we have just one pKa. But what was the pKa value? You know, like when you are raising, actually changing the organic solvent, of course, you all the time get the different pKa values. And then you have two different ways uh, to analyze the data and to actually to extrapolate the data and calculate the volume in the pure water. The old way is just uh, the plot. I mean, like you plot the pKa data depending on the weight percentage of the methanol. And that, that's, let's say, the old way that Mizutani was, that Mizutani developed. And then yashuda shedlowski equation, if you use it, you take into account the change of the activity of the water, which of course you have to take into account if you're speaking about the potentiometric measurements. And you also take into account the change of the dielectric constant because you are adding methanol to water. So you are decreasing, we are decreasing the, the percentage. And what we got actually were the volumes of the pKa that are over nine. So it's quite different. Uh, comparing to what we saw in water. So we said like, okay, uh, with the spectrophotometry, we saw the change that we didn't expect. With the potentiometry, we got the data that resembled the, the prediction that we got. So what was in behind? Like what was going on? You know, like, and uh, instead of having, in a way, simple experiment of just determining the pKa with the, okay, the tough molecule, but, this is something that we wanted to do just as a beginning, you know, like of other studies that we wanted to prepare. Like we were working in the solubilization of clofazamine and trying to make the better soluble formulation of clofazamine. Actually, we spent months of trying to find out what's wrong with our data, actually, what is going on in the solution. So we said, you know, like there are 
of course, we assumed with the experiments that we have that there could be the aggregation that is taking place in the solution. And you have some a few experimental techniques to, to uh, check if there is the aggregation going on in solution. One of them we have used, and it's, I mean, like not with the clofazamine, but LCM, SMS is the technique that you can use, but not with such a low soluble compound. Also, you can use the NMR, but not with such a low soluble compound. So the first thing, thing that we thought about is like, what shall we do? And we said, like, let's calculate the spectra. And we invited to collaborate uh, the professor Kim Tan from University of Macau, also the guy who we know for, for years. And he calculated the spectra, assuming that there is the possible aggregation. And of course, I'm not going to show you all the spectra that we that we that we got, but according to these that we tested, like this is 20% volume percent methanol calculated to weight percent, 40%. Uh, volume percent and the 60 percent methanol. These are the same uh, solutions that we use for the spectrophotometric measurements. You can see that in all these calculated spectra, uh, PCA analysis gave us actually, let's say, the proof or uh, just uh, proved our idea that the aggregation can be the reason why we were getting such a strange values uh, PKA values when we were doing the spectrophotometry. Of course, the aggregation is not something that you will easily see with, I mean, like it will not affect the PKA determination with the potentiometry, but in such a huge pi system, pi electron system, if you are doing just the spectrophotometry, it, it can give you completely wrong idea of what is really happening in solution. This is actually what, what happened to us. Luckily, we uh, actually decided to spend a lot of time uh, trying to find out what is going on in the solution. So it took us months. We also calculated the, the um, volumes of aggregation constants. And is, you can see here, like log K is over five. So it means that we cannot neglect the aggregation in such a molecule, uh, in such a, I mean, like in a clofazamine solution. So we also did the, uh, I'm sorry for this email interruption. We also asked the colleague to do the, some uh, DFT calculations and to try to see whether it is feasible and probable that the clofazamine will aggregate in methanol and water. And as we expected with such a high planar P, pi systems, of course, the aggregation is one of the probable processes that will happen with a pretty similar uh, probability uh, in water and in methanol that you can, I mean, like you can see the, the energies of aggregation. We also calculated some uh, non-covalent interactions. They also told us that it's very probable that clofazamine will aggregate both in methanol and in water solutions. What we also did as the experimental determination is some NMR. We did it to try to see whether just one nitrogen is getting protonated and or both. So this was also another this was experimental proof that there are not two ionization processes. As you can see, like following these, uh, I mean, like this is the proton, proton NMR, and uh, we did it in the, in the molecular form. We uh, recorded the spectra in molecular form, and we also recorded the spectra with the excess of uh, trifluoroacetic acid, which gave us a surely protonated form. And we could see that only one nitrogen is getting protonated. And at the end, this is the, light, uh, the last slide, actually, the last, last research slide. Uh, we published the whole paper about just the PKA. And we determined the PKA. We didn't calculate the average because we think it's uh, more fair to, to show both values. 9.43 we got with the potentiometry. 9.61 we got with the spectrophotometry. With such a tough molecule, this is not a huge discrepancy, I would say. But we also have to take care that in molecules like clofazamine or some other tough molecules, especially if there, there is a huge pi, pi electron system, you have to take care that there could be possible aggregation. I mean, like aggregation take, can take place and that the equilibria that you are following is not just the simple uh, dissociation or protonation, that something else can be happening. And I know that I'm already in the 20, 22nd minute, so I'm just going to take you all for the attention. 
And I just want to thank also to all of my collaborators. This is the lab, uh, Professor Abuzer Judin's lab in the St. John's University in New York. Uh, Professor Abu Zarajuddin and Alex Avdif, and this is Mufadal, who is also doing the P who is now doing the PhD in Abu's lab. Kintam from University of Macau and Dushan Veljkovic were also involved. Dushan did the DFT studies. Kin were involved in the PCA, PCA and calculating UA visible spectra. And I was mostly involved in all of the measurements. And thank you all for the attention. And just as a teacher, scientific teacher, I have to say that I have to conclude with saying that, you know, like if we do not take care about the precision of the measurements, I think we cannot draw any, any of the valuable conclusions. So even the uh, pH measurements, the electrode calibration, uh, caring about every single possible spectra is what comes first, I would say. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Tatiana, for this very interesting presentation. Um, we will take questions later. Uh, I don't see any in the panel for now. Um, so we're going to jump to uh, the next uh, presentation from uh, Rebecca Ruiz. Um, Rebecca, you can go ahead and share your screen and uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Perfect. So, yes, um, thank you, Eric, for your introduction. And thank you, Robert, for inviting me. And welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this presentation on flavonoids and some examples of challenge PKA determination. So this talk is going to focus on the difficulties that we have found in the PKA determination of some compounds. I'm going to discuss some case study which are very good examples to show that it's not always easy to determine a PKA and in some cases is quite uh, challenging. Okay, so because, yes, all the examples that I'm going to show uh, was using the Pion Sirius T3, I would like to give you an overview about this instrument. Uh, T3 is an automated uh, potentiometer, which determines not only PKA, log P, and solubility as well. Uh, this instrument uses two techniques the, for the determination of the PKA, the spectrometric and the potentiometric. Just a quick description of the instrument. The measurement cell is just only five milliliters um, for titrations of 1.5 milliliters of the media. So we have the amini pH electrode, the capillaries to dispense the titrants and the media, the temperature sensor, a spectroscopic deep probe, and the starter. We have also the turbidity sensor uh, to detect uh, precipitation. So, um, as I said, uh, we have in this instrument two techniques, the spectrometric and the potentiometric. So here in this slide, we have the um, spectrometric technique for UV active compounds. That means compounds with chromophore groups or conjugated systems close to the ionized center. So this technique determines the PKA uh, by the changes in the absorbance as the sample is uh, ionized with the pH. So based in the, on the theory that two uh, different species uh, involved in the PKA needs to have different spectrum. So for the uh, spectrometric technique, we have two methods, the fast UV, the fast UV is a quick assay, six minutes, um, operates between two and 12, and is using a safe spectrum, so is quick and quite efficient. The UV metric operates in an over wider pH um, range, in below pH 2 and above pH 12, and it uses a fresh reference spectrum for each sample. So the UV metric technique is therefore more accurate than the fast UV, but yes, needs more time 
to get a result. So only just saying that both methods have, uh, is using really um, small amount of sample, five microliters of DMSO, 10 millimolar DMSO stock solution. And if the sample is not um, soluble in water, we can use cosolvent media as well. So the potentiometry technique operates uh, between two and 12, and the PKA is calculated using the charge mass balance equations. Uh, it's more powerful than a spectrometric because you can find any PKA, no matter if the sample is or not UV active, as Tatiana commented, but yes, it requires more amount of sample and the probability of precipitation um, is higher. So here we have our first uh, case study is Rosbengal. Rosbengal has three PKAs uh, predicted, but for the purpose of this study, I'm going to focus on the phenolic groups, the two high acidic PKAs. So we use predictions as they help us to design a, the experiment and to understand the results. So we use Percepta as predicted package because ACD uh, labs uh, software is incorporated in our software and the software of the instrument. So we have started to analyze this sample using the UV metric technique in um, co-solvent um, media. So you can see uh, this is the data that we collected between the pH 2 and 12. And you can see here that we determine only one pKa. So it seems like the other pKa that was predicted a high pH um, maybe was outside of the, the, of the limit of this technique. However, we perform a second titration in this case uses, using the potentiometric technique. So you can see here that using the potentiometric technique, we have a concentration factor, almost two instead of one. So that means that the instrument titrated twice the sample. So it titrated the double of the PKAs that we expected. So what is the second PKA? So actually, um, the UV data uh, actually gave us uh, two PKAs with the same value because it was the only way to really fit the data to the model. So really, um, Rosvengal has two PKAs with the same value. So actually, looking at the structure, you can see the symmetry between the two phenolic groups, but based on our experience, symmetrical ionizable groups don't have the same PKA. And the reason is because compounds change conformation uh, when they are in solution because the flexibility of the structure. However, Ross Bengal is not that flexible, it's quite rigid. So that could be an explanation one, why the two PKAs have the same value. So in this case, using two techniques, as Tatiana commented, spectrometric and potentiometric um, help us to understand the result because both techniques are complementary each other and both techniques needs to uh, explain the same story. So next example is indomethacin. Indomethacin has a carboxylic acid with a PKA around four and the two predictive models gave us the same result. So we thought that, okay, this is an easy PKA to determine. So we perform the assay using the UV metric. Again, starting a high pH because um, a high pH is when the sample will be dissolved just to, just to help the solution. The PKA determined was 387. So after that, we perform another assay to determine the log P. And again, you can see that we have a factor of two, meaning that the instrument, again, titrated twice the sample. However, this is not the same example as Rose Bengal because indomethacin only has one PKA. So it turns out that indomethacin decompose a high pH and give 
two carboxylic acids as the composition products. And you can see here that the pKa's of the two uh, products are similar to the pKa or of indomethacine. So it's quite difficult to notice the decomposition. However, to, you know, to be able to study this decomposition, we perform another assay from low to high, and this is the spectra associated. So if we compare this spectra with the one that we have obtained a high pH, which is this one, you can see that both spectra are different. So the spectra of a compound cannot change between assay because assays because always we are titrating the same compound. However, if the compound is not the same, because in this case, uh, for example, the composition happens, so we are going to have different UV changes with the pH and we are going to have a different spectra. So in our first titration, when we perform the determination of the pKa starting a high pH, actually we are starting from the composition uh, conditions, means that um, all the cells uh, were the same because in the methane was already decomposed. So we didn't realize about the decomposition. So this case uh, help us to understand that, again, different techniques are the key to realize that the sample had decomposed. And not only that, uh, changing the conditions of the experiment. So in this case was starting from different um, pH directions from high to low, low to high to confirm the the, the composition and to compare the spectrum. So we publish this um, uh, this in this paper the solubility because we have realized after studying the decomposition on, of indomethacine that was a wrong solubility published because uh, the degradation in in the indomethacine was not noticed. So now, yes, let's talk about, about flavonoids. And yes, even uh, there is a great interest in flavonoids in the recent um, years. There is little data related with the determination of the physicochemical properties of these samples because they are quite complicated compounds. So flavonoids have for one to five or even six phenolic groups. All of them has high pKa values and not only that, they are close together. Many flavonoids are not stable at basic pH, they compose a high pH, making the determination even more difficult for these high pKa's. So and not only that, the Flavonoids are poorly soluble in water, so makes the determination more complicated. So in this study, we have selected these nine flavonoids, uh, categorized in these three uh, families, the flavanones, flavones, and flavonols. But uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I will focus only in two of them, uh, quercetin and fisetin. Um, in this slide, you can uh, see the, the work, um, the reference of the work that we publish. So this slide uh, shows the pKa's of the nine flavonoids found in different publications using different techniques and is also added uh, the predicted packages of Spark and Percepta for the prediction of the pKa's is quite surprising. The lack of integrity in the data that we have found in literature, for example, uh, for the five PKAs of quercetin, only one publication was found which determined the five of them. And however, if you compare these PKAs with the rest of the published PKAs, you will see difference even higher than one log unit. For fisetin, it's even worse because we couldn't find any uh, pKa published in the literature that we um, uh, look for. Okay, 
So let's start for quercetin. Quercetin has five acidic pKa. And yes, the predictions give, and, give us that some of them seems like they are uh, quite high. So maybe we will not able to determine geometrically. However, we perform a geometric uh, assay in water uh, and in order to avoid the decomposition, the titration was started from low to high. However, as I said, um, these compounds are poorly soluble and we observe precipitation, a low pH, which is marked here with this yellow area in the graph. And so was uh, not possible to determine the low pKa as it was under precipitation conditions. So you can see that the data, the data, oops, sorry. Yes, so here, we can see that the data a uh, high pH couldn't be refined. And we explain that because it's uh, an effect of the decomposition. So we couldn't refine this data and so were rejected from the calculations. So in order of compare um, the decomposition, so we perform another essay, but now starting from high pH, from the composition conditions, and this is the UV data. So we can see that the spectra are different because we have different compounds in solution. So the UV changes with the pH are different. And you can see again a high pH. We couldn't refine the data, maybe because the effect of the composition. So Looking this data, we only could uh, determine three of the five pKa's of quercetin. So what we did is just, okay, let's change the method. So instead of um, UV metric, let's uh, use the fast UV. Remember, fast UV is a fast technique, six minutes. So maybe we could, uh, we can um, avoid precipitation and not only that, maybe we can avoid as well the composition. So you can see that in this case, actually, the uh, precipitation didn't happen and we didn't observe the composition. So what we do is the same, the same as we did before. So we perform another titration from low to high to in order to, ex to study the extent of the decomposition. So, <clears throat> You can see here again, the spectra are different because we have um, different compounds in solution. Uh, not only that, we observe an additional pKa low pH when we were uh, performing the assay from high to low as a result of the decomposition. And again, we couldn't fit the data. So finally, we could um, determine the five pKa's of quercetin. However, we didn't stop here. We wanted to study uh, at which pH the composition starts. So for that, we were using the fast UV method again, and we perform several titrations from high to low, but starting at different pH values. And then we were comparing the UV data from this uh, titrations with the UV data from the titration from low to high where uh, the composition didn't happen. So we have here two decomposition effects to follow the low pKa, which appears as a result of the decomposition and the changes in the spectra. So in this slide, it's easy to observe that the titration is starting at pH 12 to the one starting at pH 11. We have the low pKa. However, from 10.5, this pKa is not there anymore. And yes, the spectra um, related with the titrations from 10.5 are similar. So we can say that the composition happens above pH 10.5 using this technique. Uh, yes, this slide shows the effect of the decomposition for quercetin. So we have the graphs absorbance versus wavelength where uh, we compare the, 
um, the changes in the spectra when the titrations were performed from opposite pH directions. And from these two graphs, we can obtain the spectra of the species involved for each PKA and compare how the shapes of this mix, the molar extinction coefficient changes due to the decomposition involved. So you can see here that the solid lines uh, are from the titrations carry, um, carry out from low to high and the dot lines from high to low when the composition happen. Okay, let's talk now about fisetin. Um, okay, fisetin has four phenolic groups. So we perform again the same study as we did with quercetin. So first titration, low to high, we didn't observe precipitation or decomposition, but we wanted to compare with the decomposition conditions. So we repeat again from high to low. Again, spectra, they are different. We observe an additional pKa at low pH, which is a result of the decomposition, and the data cannot be refined at high pH. So for fisetin, we uh, determine four PKAs. But we didn't stop here. So we wanted to know from which pH uh, fisetin actually is decomposing. So again, we um, perform different um, titrations starting a high pH, but at different pH values and compare the spectra when decompose and not decompose. So to the, remember the effects to follow, low pKa, change in the spectra. So we can see in this slide that, yes, that from the titrations starting at pH 12 uh, to the one starting at 11.5, uh, uh, we have the low pKa, which is the result of the, the composition, but from pH 11, this pKa is not anymore and the spectra are similar. So we can say that the composition happens above pH 11 using this technique. So again, we have the graphs absorbance versus wavelength to compare the changes in the spectra when the titrations were performed from opposite pH directions. And again, from these two graphs, we can obtain the spectra of the species involved for each pKa as it shows in this slide. So we have published the PKAs of quercetin and fisetin and the rest of the flavonoids study. And it's easy to understand the discrepancy between the data found published due to the difficulty, the difficulty for the determination of the PKAs of this sample. However, we are very proud to publish for the first time the four and five PKAs of fisetin and quercetin. Um, now with the conclusions, so several techniques and different SA settings must be used to be able to confirm results as different techniques are complementary, giving enough information for a better understanding of the behavior of the drug. Performing two titrations at opposite pH directions allows stability evaluation and the correct determination of the PKAs. Fast UV was proved to be a technique which avoids, in this study, the composition and precipitation in comparison with the UV metric technique. The use of PKA predictions helps to design the experimental conditions, saving sample, and offering additional information in order to evaluate the results. And for the first time, two completely new ionization constants have been determined in this study. Um, I would like to thank the chemists in Pion Analytical Service, and the Kennedy, Cesarino Nowak, Daniel Dabry, and also Sam Lee. A special thank you to the University of Barcelona, to the doctors, Clara Raffles, Elizabeth Bosch, Elizabeth Fuguet, and Meriche Magne. So we have arrived to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for attending. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Rebecca, for another interesting presentation. Uh, I think we have 
a little bit of time because I want to share a few slides too uh, with uh, maybe one question for each. I guess there's some equity here. Um, that Tatiana, there, there was a question from Robert on how prevalent uh, is the aggregation phenomenon uh, in sort of standard drug space? And um, and is there a way, are there metrics uh, to potentially predict compounds that might be prone to the aggregation? Okay, I have already answered, but I'm not sure who is uh, who can see the answer. So in, uh, in uh, my opinion, actually, and my experience, especially in recent two years while we started paying special attention to aggregation, affecting actually the PKA is that aggregation is quite probable, I would say, uh, if you have quite, uh, I mean, like low soluble molecule, if you have the huge pi, uh, pi, pi electron system, and if you have the, uh, the planarity. So I think the hydrophobicity and planarity are pretty much affecting. I'm not sure how how we can predict that something that you uh, who are doing the calculations, you computer chemists should should do. But as far as I have seen with the molecules like extremely lowly soluble terfinadine that I studied also with Alex, clofazamine, they are both having high hydrophobic parts of the molecule, and some of them are planar. And I would say that it's. Uh, quite probable that you will have the aggregation at some point if you have huge pi system, pi electron system, and uh, at least a piece of planarity. Hmm. That so uh, maybe uh, some metrics based on you know how much sp three you know character you you have might be might be a good metric. Uh, some something that maybe an interesting uh, potential interesting correlation. Um, well, thank you, thank you for your answer. Um, and there's one for uh, Rebecca. So you, you were showing, uh, you know, some in silico values for those PKAs. Uh, did you submit uh, these predictions to admit predictor and see if uh, you were able to get closer to uh, to reality? Um, oh. or, or maybe our most recent model, because that that you know may may provide some uh, some more accurate. Uh, yeah, good yeah, predictions. we'd be. So Will be nice to to try other predictions or more modern, because some of them are out. Yeah, so um, really comparing the experimental. Actually, Alex uh, asked the same question, and I'm not sure if uh, everybody can see uh, the answered section of Q and A. Uh, I have submitted numbers for quercetin and fisetin. All right. Can, can okay. everybody see the, the answered uh, section or, or not? I saw it, but I'm not sure whether uh, those who are I, not panelists can see I it. I saw know. the answer. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, can see them, but I'm, I'm part of the organizers, so I don't know if everybody on the on the call can, can see Yeah, them. yeah, exactly. That's, that's, what, that's what I mean. I wonder if yeah, the audience um, can yeah. see. Um, open, answered, and, and dismissed. Uh, there are three sections in the q and Q &A. Let's... It's amazing you can do this in real time, Robert, as uh, as we're going through the call. So uh, good, very, very good one. Um, all right. Well, at least we got two done. Um, I want to share a few slides to conclude um, to conclude our series on this uh, ionization summit. Uh, I would like to share a few slides on the uh, partnership uh, aspects. So I'm going to share my screen and. Um, and hopefully everybody can see it, share, there we go. So on the power of, you know, data sharing, because we've been, you know, talking about these improvements to, to models, which of course, you know, come from experimental data. I mean, this is the root of it. And this is what, why today's session is really important because it's, you know, we, we can see the kind of calls that one has to make uh, on the experimental data. So, um, and the, the problem statement really around, you know, building these models is, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the, the public data sets are very limited and they are not in many instances representative of what, of the kind of molecules that our customers are work, working with. Um, and uh, we've been very fortunate to to be able to, to collaborate with, um, uh, with pharma companies and and you know fairly er early on because there's clearly a lot of potential for the expansion of of, of chemis chem chemistry space 
not only the expansion itself, but the expansion to areas that are directly relevant to what you know our, our customers work work on. And of course, we have to work with a hurdle around the sensitivity of the of the data. Um, you know, we we work with data that's uh, that's confidential, of course. So we we have to work through legal and and um, and um, other um, other hurdles um, associated with sharing. So. Um, and there's of course a lot of data curation that is um, that is required on on the data, pretty much regardless of the of the source. And and you know Robert's done a huge amount of that, and uh, and also dealing with the the com the complexity um, of uh, the model construction, especially for P uh, PKA. Uh, so it's a high level of effort for us, and we typically like to associate. Those level of efforts do a big quantum leap in the quality of the of the model, and and if you follow this series, you realize that, you know, for the PK model, it's mission accomplished. But really, we only know that once the work is done. <laughs> there is no way that we can look at the first model, look at the volume of data, and say, oh yeah, you know, we'll be able to get to something that's going to be this much better. Uh, we really don't know until, you know, we get. Um, you know, we get through uh, working with the with the data and, and building the new model. Not only building it, but testing it uh, on on external data external data sets. So, as as you've seen, uh, we we've done a lot of work uh, in the early days with Bayer, uh, starting in 2012, and then more recently, um, you know, with with data coming from Roche, Genentech, and um, Bayer Crop uh, Science. So we've been able to collaborate very successfully with these companies, you know, over the past, um, you know, pretty much 12, 12 years. Um, and and as we said, um, you know, there's a limited amount of data uh, out there. And initially we, we were, were able to augment that, that data by a very significant margin. And the recent contributions from Roche, Genentech and, and Bayer really brought it to a completely different level. Um, and you can see from the number of ionization constants here, uh, we're around 35,000 or so. Um, and now we have uh, more than the double uh, with the, the, the recent contributions from uh, from this year and and, and last year, uh, and concomitant with these very substantial uh, addition of data, we have huge improvement in the root mean square error of the predictions. Uh, in some cases, that are you know pretty much going to to half. Um, so, again, um, we're able to uh, to accomplish some very significant milestones thanks to this uh, large infusion of data. Now the question comes, what's the time scale? You know, uh, do we give you guys data and then maybe you know three years or five years from now we can expect something? Uh, no, 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 that's that's not at all the way it works. So to give you a sense of you know how quickly this got done, um, you know the you know data contracts got signed um, around what July of last year and then October of last year. Uh, data is typically obtained, you know, a couple of weeks later, and then model development went on from July of last year until April of this year. So Ro Robert, you know, really did a phenomenal job about you know six months or so, you know, worth of work uh, in in model development with a final model selection, you know, happening um, around the middle of April of of this year. So notice this is a really really short. You know, time scale. We're talking about about you know nine months or so. Um, you know, from start to to finish, and we had the commercial release, you know, back in June. So, uh, uh, so again, this is very accelerated. You know, time time scale. Uh, with with even in the middle of that, the the data con the data contributors actually testing these these models and making sure they were performing well on data sets that were never seen by the by the model. So, um, you know, typically the the ownership of the data, you know, stays with the client. Obviously, uh, the model, the ensuing model, is the property of Simulations Plus, and we like to uh, validate and uh, publish jointly with with our customers when we do these kinds of uh, collaborations. Um, they're 
you know, typically cashless. There's there's no money involved either way um, with those types of collaborations. So um, we're of course always interested in in uh, collaborating around data. There are you know some areas are more prone than others uh, and and uh, of higher interest than than uh, others. Uh, we're very interested in providing some level of uh, uh, autonomy independence to the to the models. Uh, I think Robert has some really bright ideas in 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 that space and uh, also in in ways to automate uh, or semi automate fully automating is difficult but uh, flag us you know potential uh, you know issues with uh, certain data points uh, and AI technologies can be really really key in getting us there. Um, there are certain chemistry spaces where you know we clearly would like to sample uh, a little bit deeper uh, parts of the beyond rule of five, uh, like protax space or microcycles of high interest. Uh, and in terms of models, uh, you know clearly things like clearance, solubility, plasma protein binding, transporters, uh, SIP induction, intestinal permeability, and UGT metabolism are, are you know very very high interest. So if you have data. In these in these spaces, or even some things that are not mentioned but may, may be very interesting, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and um, we definitely have a lot of uh, in-house knowledge in terms of data curation, models construction, and model validation. And we'd be very happy to apply that knowledge towards um, you know uh, building something new. So um, I want to thank everybody who. You know, presented. You know, contributed, asked questions, and and even people who uh, ended up attending. Everyone who ended up uh, attending these uh, four four sessions, and um, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you found those interesting, and I hope also you can join us for uh, future events. So thank you again, and I will let um, J Jasmine conclude our seminar today. Sure. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you all for any questions we were unable to answer live today. Our business development team will reach out to you with answers following the webinar. You can also visit our website um, for a recording or to learn more about our ionization modeling capabilities. Um, I put a couple links in the chat. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube channel. Make sure to share your thoughts in the post webinar sur survey that follows. Um, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you again. Thank you to all. Have a great rest of the day.